Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. My guest today is again Imam Muhammad Al Asi, who is the Mufassir of the Noble Quran titled The Ascendant Quran Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Twelve volumes of this monumental tafsir have already been published. Two more volumes are ready to go to press, and many other volumes are under preparation. Each volume is available at $30 each anywhere in North America, including shipping and handling from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0. Brother Muhammad, welcome back to the program. It's nice to be back. Okay, now, um, we know that the first revelation uh, came to the noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in the cave of Hira when Jibreel alayhi wa came to him and said, Iqra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq in, in the first five ayats of Surah Al-Alaq. Uh, many English translations have rendered Iqra as read. Uh, now obviously, Jibreel alayhi salam didn't bring a piece of paper to the Prophet sallallahu to read. So is that accurate to say or how would you uh, translate it? Well, literally speaking, the word iqra means read. Okay. But what goes along with reading is understanding. And so, uh, the first word from Allah in His revelation to His Prophet uh, was the word iqra. And the following ayat, there, there's, the word iqra is, is used. So the word Iqra is mentioned uh, in, uh, in two fields of knowledge. The first one is... Um, the creational field, which is the materialistic world, so our, our reading and understanding should be uh, directed or should be concentrated on what is called the physical sciences of today. This is like saying when you read and understand, try to read and understand, detect observe, detect uh, the laws, the divine laws that Allah has placed in the material world. So here you have things like physics and chemistry and um, biology and all of these, uh, uh, what's called hard sciences. The second iqra in the ayah, iqra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama bil qalam allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. This has to do with the social sciences. To read or try to, after reading obviously we understand you. How can someone understand without reading? How can someone understand without communicating? So, uh, when, we commun when we read and communicate, the objective that, uh, of this second type of qira'a, this second type of reading, supposed, is supposed to be concentrated on uh, man and his sciences. And man, as we know, is not, is not a robot. We don't belong strictly to the physical or material world. There's more to us than that. There's a psychology in man, there's a sociology in man's society. So our, our reading, our understanding, to take it a step further, our analyses, our coordination of knowledge has to do with this aspect of man. So in, the, in these first verses that were revealed by Allah to man, He is telling us, and this is... Of course, in the first instance, the verses here are speaking to the Prophet. That the Prophet should uh, pursue these types of uh, acquisitions of knowledge. But then as followers of Allah's Prophet, we are also commanded 
to do the same thing. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this, then we look at, okay, so what's the result? What are we doing? And you look at today's Muslim world, how, how many accomplishments can we attribute to ourselves, whether it is in the world of physical sciences, or whether it is in the world of behavioral sciences? Where are the Islamic uh, thinkers who have um, uh, theories or breakthroughs, or inventions, or discoveries in the material and in the social worlds. Almost zilch, unfortunately. And that goes back, once again, to our lack of understanding of the honorable revelation that we are tasked with. Okay. Now, um, the, um, we know from the uh, prophetic Sunnah and Sirah that the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. That was the prophetic mission of the Noble Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now after he received the first revelation, was there uh, a period of uh, sort of um, waiting or something before the next set of ayat uh, were revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or how did it work out? Well, the way Revelation, the history of Revelation really had to do with building uh, the Islamic character in the individual and giving direction to the Islamic society in life. So there was, there was no uh, specific time period between one revelation and the next. Today, let's say a revelation came, certain verses were revealed by Allah through the angel Gabriel. They were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And there's meanings in, in whatever these verses were. So the Muslims would, would understand these meanings translate their understanding of these meanings into a behavior. And this may take days, it may take weeks, and it may take months to do that. Once that is accomplished and the Muslims in life encountered another challenge, there were further revelations that would come in sequence, to address those challenges. Initially, the challenges, as I said, in the Meccan era, they may have been basically psychological challenges. It was torture, it was persecution, it was displacement, there was a, there was a type of um, alienation and isolation of the Muslims. All of this required some guidance from on high to these individuals now who are subjected to the powers on earth who wanted to basically do away with them in, in, in any way possible. So they, they needed guidance. What do they do? If they were in Mecca, if there was a few of them and they were persecuted, are they allowed to, uh, to fight back at their persecutors? to take physical uh, opposition against those who were inflicting harm on them, or not. And obviously in those first 13 years, with the assortment of pressures that were put on the Prophet and the followers with him, we're talking probably about uh, a hundred or two, total followers in Mecca during that time period. Obviously it was all peaceful. There was no, no order or no uh, directive from the Almighty to take uh, what you may call a, um, a physical stand against the oppressors. But then it was another issue when the Muslims became a society in al Medina and there was aggression, hostilities, and aggression against them. Wars that were declared against the Muslims who were just minding their own business, trying to build their own community and society. So what do they do in this, in this 
time frame? What did they do under such circumstances? Here is where they would anticipate that Allah would reveal verses from the Qur'an to tell them how to move forward, what to do in these circumstances. If war is imposed on them, do they uh, uh, succumb? Do they surrender to their enemies without putting up a fight to defend themselves? Or will they fight? So, you know, they, they just were tuned in and waiting for uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell them how to proceed forward. So there were verses, that, and as I said, this, you know, there's not a specific time period between one cluster of ayat that were revealed at one time and another cluster of ayat. It all depended on the dynamics of the development of an Islamic reality and an Islamic lifestyle. Now, um, is it correct to say, uh, remaining with the you know, process of revelation, that um, some surahs or perhaps many surahs were revealed piecemeal, others were revealed all at once? I want, to, I want your um, sort of explanation of the surahs that were revealed piecemeal. Um, how were the new ayats that were revealed then placed in the correct order or the sequence? How did that sort of process occur? Well, the, yeah, there, in the Qur'an there are very long surahs yes. and there are very short surahs. The very short surahs were revealed all at once. The very long surahs, some of them have 200, almost 300 verses in them. They were revealed at certain times. Uh, and, when ev and the organization, I mean, if these ayat were revealed at different times, how are we going to organize these ayat together, these verses together? How are we going to put one set of verses before the other, and then the second set before the third, and so forth and so on, until we reach the end of the surah. So, that was the Prophet's task. The Prophet, when he read these verses from the Qur'an, he read them in that sequence. So when the compilation of the Qur'an took place, it all only took those who lived with them, uh, many of them who had memorized the Qur'an, uh, to say to come together and say this is how we memorize the Quran it had this sequence to it this is the first ayah in let's say surah al-baqarah these are the first ayat these are the following ayat until we get to the end of the surah so they all agreed that this was the sequencing of the prophet and that's and, and that's how we have the uh, arrangement of the ayat in the different surahs. Now I want to say here also that some surahs, especially the very long ones, they have in, in, in them, because the surahs are not organized in the, uh, the component segments of each of these long surahs. Some of them were revealed in Mecca and some of them were revealed in Al Medina. So when you read, and the surah is, because the surahs of the Quran are categorized either as Meccan surahs or as Medini surahs. Surahs that were revealed in Mecca or surahs that were revealed in Al Medina. Now, when we, when we have a certain surah like Surah Al-Baqarah or Surah Ali Amran or Surah Al-Nisa, when we have some ayat in these surahs that were revealed in Mecca and other ayat in these surahs that were revealed in al Medina, So the Qur'an does not follow a chronological order of arranging the sequencing of the ayat. That sequencing of the ayat was done by the Prophet and it was preserved in that manner. Now, when you explain this, um, 
I mean, it, it's, it sounds like a very, very difficult task for the Prophet ﷺ that, you know, some um, verses are revealed in Makkah, some are revealed in Medina, and then uh, they're arranged in, in such a way that there's an absolute flow in these, in these surahs. Yeah, well, I don't think the Prophet was doing this just because of his better judgment. He was doing this because he had uh, uh, guidance from above. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him in the way these verses in the Qur'an should be arranged and put together. And he was just following, so to speak, following orders. Right. Now, uh, we know that the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi is, is referred to in the Noble Qur'an as Ummi. Uh, please explain the meaning of uh, this word uh, so that we get a better understanding of it and then I'm going to follow up with another uh, question relating to this. Yeah, the uh, most of the translations that we have, um, if not the overwhelming majority of them, I haven't done a survey here in this area, but it appears that very, very uh, many translators uh, they translate the word ummi as illiterate. And strictly in the um, linguistic sense of the word, uh, in the overwhelming cases, the word ummi means illiterate. That's in the linguistic. But the uh, Quranic words have linguistic origins, out of which come what, what is called shara'i definitions, or... Ju ju uh, jurisprudential definitions. And the word ummi is one of these words. Like an ayah in Surah Al Jumu'ah, it is He, meaning Allah, who was sent to the ummis, the same word here, a messenger from among their own selves. So what ummi means is that uh, the prophet and the ummiyin, his the people he was sent to, uh, were scriptureless. Uh, if we take uh, prophetic history, apostolic history, if we take that history, we say we like I mentioned earlier. And probably in another segment uh, or another interview, I mean, um, the um, uh, I lost my train of thought at this moment. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is the word ummi has a shara'i uh, extension to it, away from its linguistic base, and that shara'i means that. They have no scripture. This is what I'm trying to say. The prophet himself comes from a society that is scriptureless. The Arabian society that the prophet came to used to look upon Jews and Christians as being people who are authorities on scripture. So if they had a question regarding Musa or Isa or any of these biblical prophets, they'd go to Christian and to Jewish scholars and religious figures and ask them, okay, what, what do you say about this and that? So this was a scripturalist society. So when the when Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his, when he's, when he's referred to as an ummi, that means he uh, uh, comes from a background that is scripturalist. He didn't come from, like Isa came from a background that, that had scripture to it. Musa, uh, the whole history of Bani Israel, the children of Israel, is a history of scripture and prophets. But the Prophet, even though he is related to Ismail and he is related to Ibrahim, but that did, and Ibrahim had what is called Suhuf, which is not, you know, technically a scripture, uh, maybe scripts, but not a scripture. And Ismail did not have a, a scripture. So in, in looking at it in that sense, we call the word Ummi, which your original question was about, means scriptureless, to the scriptureless prophet. Now, um, they, um, as, as you mentioned, 
uh, that um, the uh, the Prophet وسلم, was raised in a uh, society, a scriptureless society. And uh, is it fair to say that the Prophet وسلم, himself could not read or write? I mean, this is an area really. It's uh, it's a challenging area. I've I've taken a look and read both sides of this. Uh, it's very hard for me to say with uh, certainty that the Prophet uh, was uh, able to read or write, or whether he was not able to read and write. Uh, I mean, I I, I don't want to go into the details here of each opinion, but. Um, I guess this is one of the areas in which you can you can look back at the history, the information about history, and say uh, if you want to be uh, of a clear conscience that there's no definitive information to tell me uh, whether the prophet uh, was uh, a person who could read or write or not. I want to move on to uh, another uh, subject matter uh, and we will inshallah pursue this in the next episode as well but uh, a lot of Muslims uh, raise this question and they say that uh, we are the followers of the last and final messenger of Allah, we have the last and final revelation of Allah in our possession. And yet, uh, when we look around the Muslim world, we see that Muslims are suffering so much. Why is that? Well, I mean, yeah, Muslims can make that claim that, you know, it's true. I mean, it, it, it's strictly in a uh, historical sense, we do belong to Allah's last prophet. We do belong to Allah's last scripture in the very historical sense, but in the practical sense, what do we have to show for that? When the Qur'an, Allah's last testament to mankind, is saying one thing, and the Prophet is teaching one thing, and the Muslims who claim that they are the heirs of the last Prophet, the last scripture, they are doing either the opposite, or they are disregarding this altogether, even though they lay that broad claim that they belong to the Qur'an and to the Prophet. So in other words, you know, actions speak louder than words. Look at the, what the Muslims do and don't pay very much attention to what they are saying. If what they do is the Qur'an in motion and with the direction of the Prophet, then yeah. And then we wouldn't be in the, 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 the many problems and many catastrophes that we are living through in our day and time. So what you're saying is that, you know, although we may be uh, uh, theoretically we claim to be Muslims, we are just nominal Muslims, we don't follow much of the teachings of the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet Yeah, and uh, much of that also can be attributed to the, uh, the decision makers that we have in our countries. There's millions upon hundreds of millions of Muslims who, in their heart, they think that, you know, they are trying to be the best Muslims that they can be. Uh, not knowing that they are programmed to be satisfied with the status quo that they are living in, which is not an Islamic status quo. It's an, uh, to be honest with you, the status quo is an official anti-Islamic status quo. But because of elements of ignorance and uh, elements of misinformation and elements of control, uh, they're sort of, you know, victims of their own, uh, in one instance, ignor ignorance, and in the most important ins instance, in the misguidance of those who rule over them. Well, we will, inshallah, continue uh, this discussion in our next episode, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. This has been most enlightening. Just thank you. Oh, and to our uh, viewers, uh, you have been uh, watching my uh, discussion with Imam Muhammad al Asi, who is the professor of the Noble Quran, titled The Ascendant Quran, Real Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Twelve volumes have already been published, two more volumes are ready to go to press and many other vo volumes are under preparation and each volume 
is available at a special price of $30 each, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America, and you can order them from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0. You've been watching Muslim Perspectives from me, Zafar Wangash, and my team here at Muslim Perspectives. We want to thank you for watching our program, and we look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you again at the same time, same channel, next Saturday. Until then, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.